right so in this video we shall be discussing some preliminary concepts regarding antipsychotics to discuss about antipsychotics we need to know something about psychosis psychosis is a syndrome which is a collection of symptoms so a symptom would be something that the patient describes like for example pain is a syndrome while a sign is something that the physician elicits from the patient like for example if the patient were to palpate the McBurney's point in a patient with acute appendicitis the patient would wince in pain now that's tenderness tenderness is a sign while pain is a symptom right so psychosis is a syndrome it is not a diagnosis by itself um, at a very basic level psychosis refers to hallucinations and delusions a delusion is a fixed belief that is not amenable to change in spite of uh, providing conflicting evidence a hallucination is a perception like experience that occurs without an external stimulus so schizophrenia is considered to be the prototypic disorder for understanding psychotic disorders but um, it should be understood that psychosis occurs in many other disorders and not just schizophrenia for example psychosis is seen in bipolar disorder it is seen in transient psychotic disorders and many other disorders right schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders are defined by abnormalities in one or more of the following five domains the domains being delusions hallucinations disorganized thinking or speech grossly disorganized or abnormal motor behavior and these four symptoms are referred to as positive symptoms while the remaining are called negative symptoms the remaining symptoms are diminished emotional expression a volition, a logia, anhedonia, and a sociality. A volition uh, basically means lack of motivation. A logia means lack of speech. Anhedonia refers to the inability to experience pleasure, and a sociality refers to lack of interest in social interactions. So, yeah. So psychotic disorders are um, expressed in terms of both positive and negative symptoms now with that background let us move into the pathophysiological concepts in schizophrenia in the 1960s a hypothesis was put forward stating that um, the positive symptoms in schizophrenia was due to a hyper dopaminergic activity in the brain as such the dopamine receptors in the brain were blocked and sure enough the positive symptoms reduced so the first antipsychotic drugs that entered the market were d2 receptor blockers now a further understanding about how these drugs work um, depends upon our understanding of the dopaminergic pathways in the brain at a very basic level there are four dopaminergic pathways in the brain they include the mesolimbic the mesocortical the nigrostriatal and the tuberoinfundibular pathways when d2 receptors are blocked in the mesolimbic pathway positive symptoms of schizophrenia reduce when d2 receptors are blocked in the mesocortical pathway there is a tendency for an increase in negative symptoms Blockade of D2 receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway result in extra pyramidal symptoms, and blockade of D2 receptors in the tuberoinfundibular pathway can lead to hyperprolactinemia. Now, these are obviously unwanted effects of a D2 receptor blocker. Um, and regarding the extra pyramidal symptoms, this is something that we need to elaborate further. Now, there are various forms of extrapyramidal symptoms that can be produced by D2 receptor blockers or first generation antipsychotic agents. 
they include dystonia, drug-induced Parkinson's disease, akathisia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, tardive dyskinesia and perioral tremors. These symptoms, namely dystonia, drug-induced Parkinson's disease, akathisia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, these uh, forms of extrapyramidal symptoms occur very very soon after the administration of an antipsychotic, after the administration of a typical or first generation antipsychotic. Tardive dyskinesia and perioral tremors are um, adverse effects that develop much later. They are delayed in onset. Right, so dystonia refers to twisting movements, especially of the face and neck. They are treated with anticholinergic agents. Drug-induced Parkinsonism um, has got the cardinal features of bradykinesia, resting tremor, rigidity and postural instability. Drug-induced Parkinson's is also treated with anticholinergic agents. Akathisia refers to the inability to keep the lower limbs still and it is treated with beta blockers like propranolol. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome refers to severe rigidity, hyperthermia and altered consciousness. It is treated with dandrolene and bromocryptin. Tardive dyskinesia refers to abnormal orolingual movements. They can be socially very inappropriate. Um, the treatment is very challenging and there are newer drugs which have entered the market for the treatment of tardive dyskinesia. They include valbenazine and deutetrabenazine. Perioral tremors are sometimes referred to as rabbit syndrome. Right. So, neuroleptic malignant syndrome can occur within 10 days of onset of therapy. Its cardinal features include, include severe muscle rigidity and hyperthermia. Okay, so, first generation antipsychotics or typical antipsychotics reduce positive symptoms, but they can increase the negative symptoms, they can produce extrapyramidal symptoms, they can cause hyperprolactinemia. So ideally, we should have drugs that can block dopamine receptors in the mesolimbic pathway, but which can increase the levels of dopamine in the mesocortical, nigrostriatal and tubero-infundibular pathways. Now, this goal is partially achieved at least by combined blockade of D2 receptors as well as blockade of 5-HT2A receptors. So 5-HT2A receptors are of course serotonin receptors. So what exactly happens when we block both D2 receptors and 5-HT2A receptors in the dopaminergic pathways? Well, in the mesolimbic pathway, the positive symptoms reduce. In the mesocortical pathway, there is a potentially a decrease in the negative symptoms. In the nigrostriatal pathway, there is reduced risk for extrapyramidal symptoms when compared to the typical antipsychotics. And regarding the tubero-infundibular pathway, there is a very reduced risk for hyperprolactinemia. So these are advantages of the so-called second generation or atypical antipsychotics over the first generation or typical antipsychotic agents. But this is not to say that atypical antipsychotics have no adverse effects. They definitely have adverse effects. And the most important adverse effect associated with atypical antipsychotics is increased insulin resistance. And when there is an increased insulin resistance, we can of course expect increased uh, um, risk for dyslipidemia, diabetes, risks for obesity, accelerated cardiovascular disease, and weight gain. Right. Okay, so this is a classification of the typical or first-generation antipsychotics.
they are broadly classified into the butyrophenones, the antipsychotic phenothiazines, and the thiazantines. The most famous example of the butyrophenones will be haloperidol. The antipsychotic phenothiazines include chlorpromazine. This was, in fact, the first ever antipsychotic drug. Right, so moving on. Thioridazine. Now, this is a first generation antipsychotic with least incidence of uh, extrapyramidal symptoms simply because it has got an anticholinergic effect as well. Uh, however, it has got certain very important adverse effects, like for example, QT prolongation and therefore increased risk of arrhythmias, and more importantly, or at least um, equally importantly, retinal deposits that can cause impaired vision. Just to note, the maximum chance for extrapyramidal symptoms among the second generation antipsychotics is for a drug called risperidone. Right. Now these are the atypical or uh, second generation antipsychotics. Um, they mainly include the serotonin dopamine antagonists. Those drugs that block both D2 receptors and the 5-HT2A serotonin receptors in the dopaminergic pathways. The most important among these drugs include clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine and risperidone. Now, it's worth noting at this point that clozapine is the only antipsychotic drug that reduces the risk of suicide in schizophrenia. So this is not to be confused with lithium. Lithium is not an antipsychotic agent, it is a mood stabilizer. It is the only drug that reduces the risk of suicide in bipolar disorder. Alright, so we spoke about the adverse effects of second generation antipsychotics which are mostly related to their propensity to cause increased insulin resistance and therefore cause its associated problems like dyslipidemia, diabetes, uh, obesity, accelerated cardiovascular disease, weight gain and so on. Now there are adverse effects which are peculiar to the second generation antipsychotic called clozapine. Some of the adverse effects are very serious and there are other adverse effects as well. The three most serious adverse effects of clozapine include agranulocytosis, myocarditis and cardiomyopathy as well as seizures. The other adverse effects of clozapine include urinary incontinence, sedation, hypersalivation also called sialosis, um, insulin resistance like any other atypical antipsychotic as well as tachycardia and hypotension. Well, because it cause, causes agranulocytosis, patients must have their blood counts monitored for as long as they are treated with clozapine. And yes, because of these multiple adverse effects, clozapine is not considered to be a first-line treatment, but is used when other antipsychotics fail. In other words, Clozapine may be considered as the first-line drug in treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Right, now, antipsychotics are also useful in bipolar disorder, not just in schizophrenia. And regarding the use of atypical antipsychotics, almost all atypical antipsychotics are approved for the manic phase of bipolar illness. In fact, they are preferred in acute mania because they have a rapid onset of action in contrast with the other drugs which are usually used in bipolar disorder drugs like lithium sodium valproate while these drugs are very effective for mania and bipolar disease they have an onset of action which is rather delayed up to three to five days now not all atypical antipsychotics are useful for the depressive phase of bipolar illness only the following examples are useful, namely quetiapine and secondly a combination of olanzapine with fluoxetine. 
Now, fluoxetine is not an antipsychotic, it is an antidepressant. To be specific, it is an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So, combining olanzapine with fluoxetine is very useful in the depressive phases of bipolar illness. These two are the other drugs, the other antipsychotics which are useful, the other atypical antipsychotics which are useful in the depressive phase of bipolar illness. Right, so this is a slide which compares the typical antipsychotics and the atypical antipsychotics.